China Money Podcast. I'm your host, Nina Xiang. Our guest today is Jack Pukowski, managing partner at China Focus Merchant Bank, JFK Holdings. He came to China in the early 1990s and founded a Simco, one of China's largest auto parts manufacturers. And he's talking to me here today in Beijing. Welcome to the podcast, Jack. Thank you. Glad to be here. First, maybe、uh, give us your sense on the Chinese economy this year. What's in store for China in 2012? I think most economists are projecting about an eight and a half percent growth rate in the GDP.、Um, you know, China has been consciously trying to slow down the economy. It grew at over ten percent in two thousand ten and about nine point two percent in two thousand eleven. But China has been concerned about inflation and about property prices, so it's been restricting credit and so forth. But you know, China needs to grow at somewhere between seven and nine percent. To、uh, to basically have an economy that can absorb all of the new workers every year, so you know we're quite optimistic that China will continue on that kind of a growth path. I think it would be a soft landing. I think those who predicted a hard landing, you know, I think didn't really take into account the fact that、uh, the Chinese government has basically all of the monetary and fiscal tools at its disposal, so it can change monetary policy quickly. It can change fiscal policy very quickly. It can go from putting more money into the economy and new projects to taking them out of the, you know, to, you know, to a policy that takes money out of the system, and, and that's something that most governments don't have. You have said that there's no such thing called a property bubble in China, and I think many people would disagree. I didn't say there was no such thing as a property bubble. What I said is that I wasn't concerned about the property bubble bursting and causing a, a big problem in, in China's economy. And that's because the Chinese government recognized what had happened, and in、uh, May of 2010 started taking action. So property prices got very, very high, particularly in places like Beijing and Shanghai. But a couple of points: one is that the government started to to, to really bring those prices down. But secondly,、um, Beijing and Shanghai, as big as they are, are still only a small percentage of the total. Population in China. I think the top city、uh, in terms of、uh, home sale or in terms of you know, per square meter sales for housing is a, over twenty thousand RMB、uh, square meter in Shenzhen. The lowest on that list is about three thousand. So here it's it's about fifteen percent in, in this in the in the lowest、uh, city in China compared to the, the highest priced city. So and, and most of the cities, frankly, are well below that twenty thousand. Apart from the price of the real estate, is the fact that、um, there's very low leverage. You know, many of the apartments are bought with all cash.、Um, to the extent they use mortgages, the, the rates are very low in terms of the percentage of value that's financed. How about China's stock market this year? Is it going to continue to disappoint? I hope not. You know, I predicted、uh, last year in 2011 that. The market would go up 25 percentage points, but uh, uh, but instead it went down 20 percentage points. So I guess my record's not too good on predicting the stock market. But、um, you know, you know, 2011 was impacted pretty heavily by the tight credit and so forth. To the extent that China eases, to the extent that maybe there's a little relief in terms of、uh, Europe and so forth.、Uh, You know, we could see an increase. I mean, I think that、uh, the Chinese stock market is due to to increase. So we'll see. Now about China's currency, the RMB. The expectation is for the appreciation pace to slow down to about three to four percent appreciation for the whole year. Do you agree with that? I would think it will slow down.、Um, the、uh, it has gone up twenty percent or so more. You know, twenty percent or more since since it was depegged from the dollar,、uh, and you know, a number of years ago. And so,、um, and I think you know, China is now, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the trade surplus is shrinking and so forth. Exports are an issue, so I think there are a lot of factors that say that、uh, the RMB, you know, appreciation against the dollar, ought to slow down. So I, I would agree with that. Do you think the RMB is already approaching a fair value? You know, it's hard to say what a fair value is because you have a. An artificial system, in the sense that、uh, money can come in through the form of export surpluses, foreign direct investment,、um, and so forth. But there are limits on how it can go out. And so, when you have a system like that, for example, if all of a sudden everybody in China woke up tomorrow 
and were able to put their money wherever they wanted anywhere in the world, how much of the RMB savings would flow out of the country into other stock markets, other financial markets. Nobody knows the answer to that question. That's really the only way you can really determine what the real fair value is. In terms of China's medium and long-term future, what are some key challenges for China to sustain its economic growth? Well, I think the big issue is the, um, the energy situation. Uh, and that's why China's been going around the world and, and, and really securing, uh, you know, uh, sources of energy. And so getting an adequate supply of energy to fuel the economy is going to be a constant challenge. Um, the, uh, in order for China to continue to grow, uh, even if it gets all the energy, what that does is that increases the stress on the environment, air pollution, water pollution, all the things that we in Beijing here are quite, uh, quite familiar with. And so China really needs to find innovative ways, new ways, to really improve its energy efficiency. Clearly the legal system is, is there, but you know, it isn't really enforced to the same extent that it should be, and so, or you know, other countries would like it to be. So there are a number of factors like that that I think are, are going to cause issues. I'm still, despite this, I think that China will overcome them, but I, you know, I think that, um, that those are going to be key issues going forward. You didn't mention social stability, and that's on top of Chinese leaders' mind, of course. Well, no, I think that's an important one because, you know, China still has, uh, you know, the way I always talk, you know, discuss it is of the billion three people, you have about 400 million people that have an average per capita income of $9,000 and 900 million people that have an average per capita of, of $800. Clearly a big, big discrepancy. The reason I didn't mention it is because I know the leadership's worried about it. <laughs> so that's one that, I, I think that is their number one concern. So they've been taking a number of steps to, uh, to really try to, uh, you know, just, you know, you know, you know, try to even out the income and to make the life of the people in the rural areas a lot more comfortable. So where do you see good investment opportunities in China right now? I think uh, anything to do with the environment. Uh, what we're finding, we're working with a lot of companies from overseas that have good technologies that can help improve energy efficiency, can help reduce emissions and so forth. And, and our experience has been that uh, if you can prove that a technology works and that it's affordable, then China will adopt it very, very quickly. And so I think there's big, big opportunities in anything related to the environment. The other big one we see is healthcare. You know, it's one of the last big industries that's being opened up to outside investment. And obviously, with the rising per capita incomes, um, you know, people want to live longer. I think the whole financial services sector. It's going to be huge. Um, you know, China still has a 50% savings rate. Uh, we're working with an insurance company. Insurance industry here is growing at 25% a year. Not because necessarily Chinese are in love with insurance, but because they look at insurance as another way to, you know, another place to put their savings. So I think that all of these, uh, you know, financial services and so forth that people are accustomed to in more developed economies are going to have a big opportunity here in China. But those are just three of them, but you know, there are a lot of opportunities in China. It's still very, very, very early in the game. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you, Nina. That's today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, please go to our website at chinamoneypodcast.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much and see you next week.